You're all very welcome back to our final paper for uh, today on the theme of the policy of ageing. And um, I'm introducing Dr. Dermot O'Shea, who's a consultant geriatrician at St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin here. He has been registrar of the RCPI since 2014 and was the clinical lead for the National Clinical Programme for Older People in the HSE from 2010 to 2019. He is the current president of the Irish Geriatological Society of Ireland. And I hope I got that one right. Perfect. Thanks, Millen. Michael, it's a real privilege to be here. And I was doodling during the course of uh, that fantastic last session. Uh, and the first note I wrote to myself was, never follow Roddy Doyle when you're at a <laughs> conference. That's very unlikely ever to happen. Uh, the second is, you know, what a privilege. As I drove down Jones's Road, uh, turned right onto Clonliffe Road and down to St. Joseph's Avenue to park in, uh, under the Cusack stand, uh, I had the privilege of, uh, when we were growing up, being regaled by stories from my father, who won three All-Ireland medals with Kerry out on that pitch. And uh, in deference to Roddy Doyle, um, I, I, uh, had a, I played at Ballybone St. Enders myself and uh, ended up with a Dublin minor trial. And un, I think much to my father's relief at the time, a few years after the ban had been dropped, uh, I, um, I, I didn't make it. So I ended up playing rugby, but there you are. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege and a pleasure to be here. Um, that decided to stop working now that I'm pressing. It worked perfectly well when I started the, earlier. Minor hiccup, yeah. A minor hiccup. Well, do you want to try? And I, and I, I start. To, I, I start over trying to get them up. Uh, there, were, there were three S's that came through to me when I was listening to this: uh, sports, um, sports, um, soundings, and uh, senescence. Were the three S's I thought of uh, as I was listening to the speakers that have gone before me. And uh, when I did the leaving search, and I'm a product of the education system. Thank you. I'm a product of the education system that was being talked about. I gambled on two poets. Uh, in soundings. One was Yeats and the other was uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. And neither of them came up on my leaving cert, so I was really stuck. Uh, but I've always retained a real love um, of uh, poetry and of literature. Uh, and as I wandered through this discourse on uh, my views on ageing, uh, I've a number of photographs peppered throughout it. So if you get bored, you can try identifying them. And if you can't identify them, I'll have dropped hints during the course of the uh, talk, but there's somebody there from, uh, two people from the 19th century and one from the uh, 20th century. And I guess the one thing that I've learned about everything we do, while Yeats wasn't writing um, about the importance of collaboration and teamwork, that quote has really resonated for me through everything we do. I mean, we've had the privilege of listening to people here um, this afternoon and this morning who are real deep thinkers about the concepts of the importance of justice uh, and social justice. Uh, and who are also real key influencers. Um, but unless you're doing that and doing it together, um, it's no good. We all have to work together. So that quote has always resonated with me. We tread the needle's eyes and all we do, all must do together. The other thing that I've always thought about is the importance of perspective. So as all of you look at that, I mean, everybody's perspective differs. Um, everybody has, uh, depending on your mood, your eyesight, or indeed what you feel, you may see uh, a, a youngish gentleman with a firm jutting chin or an older woman with a wrinkled mouth uh, and a funny hat. And, you know, perspectives are very important, but entirely for all of us at every age and stage, we should seek opportunities to improve how we age and how we support those who age. My wife is enormously relieved that I'm not going to sing the opening few lines of this poem or song, but that was written by Paul McCartney. And it's interesting, it was written by Paul McCartney for, uh, I'll get this wrong, I'm sure somebody will correct me, for uh, the Lonely Hearts uh, Sergeant Pepper Club Band album in 67. And he wrote it in the early 60s, and he wrote it, they think, as a tribute to his father. And the age, for any of you who would care to sing the song in your head, is when I'm 64. Uh, but that was old age then. 
Um, old age isn't a disease, it's strength, survivorship, it's triumph over all sorts of vicissitudes, disappointments, trials and illnesses. And I think Ireland has become, or modern Ireland is a very forward and forward thinking society. So I think inspiring our country to be a place you'd want to grow up and grow old in isn't such a far reach. And I really like this poem. And again, Yeats wrote this poem in the early 1900s. Uh, and he wrote it when he was uh, around, I think, the age of uh, 45, 50. And life expectancy when he wrote it was around the mid 50s. So I think it's quite interesting when you begin to reflect on what people were thinking and what they were thinking was old age. And old age has certainly changed for me as I've got older. Um, I think, in my own view, I think we're all forever young. And you'll scan some of the pictures here yourself. And we heard about the importance of sports and funding sports correctly. I disagree a little maybe with Roddy Doyle. Um, I think sporting, sports in general, which promote uh, collaboration, teamwork, and actually build resilience. I think they should be funded. Uh, and you know, whether it's golf or football or Gaelic or uh, tiddlywinks or whatever, the important thing is that people are doing things together. I think for me, what's interesting about this, I clearly remember this particular sporting event, and I'll come back to Eamon Cotton in years to come. But there are people there that you may recognise. They're forever trapped at a certain age because that's the age we look at them. And I think you know the public discourse on ageing. There's all sorts of different ages when people think ageing begins. Um, from a demographic analysis, and you've heard um, this morning's talk, uh, you know, from a demographic analysis point of view, actually, it's taken a 60 to make things easy from the point of view of figuring it out. Uh, between 2015 and 2050, we'll go from 900 million to 2 billion people over the age of 60. It's enormous. From a social justice pension rights point of view, it's 65, because that's when they kick in in developed countries. Um, in Ireland, I don't know what exactly the old age would be, but I think I've, ju I've just put this up to have a look at it, and you heard the stats this morning, but look what's happening in the over 70s. That's 2006, red is over 70, that's 2011, and that's 2016. The population is visibly ageing, and I see that in the work that I do around the country, um, or in Dublin, and I hear about it from around the country from the other work I've been involved in. You heard from Elizabeth's lovely talk on the longitudinal study of ageing in children, effectively. There's an Irish longitudinal study of ageing uh, in, in, in older people, and that's harmonised with a whole group of, of um, longitudinal studies around the world. So we have a lot to learn, and the Ireland longitudinal study of ageing came to the table late, so it was able to build on work that was being done in other studies. We have a lot to learn from the people in Japan. Have I got my geography right? Yeah. Um, and I'll come back to them in just a little while. The Irish Longitudinal Study of Ageing has 8,500 people over the age of 50. They're dotted all over the country. And that's providing us with evidence for policy to promote independent living, extended lifespan. You heard from Colette and Sean Moynihan this, mor this, afternoon, or this morning around you know, living at home. So there's loads of information that we're gathering around the country from our own over 50s population. And like what Elizabeth said, that study has been replenished as well uh, I actually meant to ask why your study had to be replenished. Was that dropout rates for just people leaving the study and not followed up? But I'll talk to you about it some other time. Um, life expectancy is an important thing, and I'll come back to it. But since 1800, where the pre-1800, the life expectancy has gone from 40 to over 80, 85 around the world. And it's been increasing. Now, there has to be, that has to level off. You know, they say that 50% of children born in 1900 uh, are 50 percent of people born today can expect to live uh, to 100 years of age there has to be a finite age that you get to i know you read the papers about you get to 120 I, i'm not particularly sure i'm aiming at 90 ish myself but i'm not particularly sure what age we'd all want to aim at i think in terms of us here from a social justice perspective look what happens in the, the quintile so women do loads of things better than men and i'm not going to ask for a straw poll of what it is people think women do better than men. But one of the things they do very much better than men is age. They both age longer and they age better. Uh, in the fifth quintile, which is the most deprived group, the life expectancy is 80. That's better than the life expectancy in the highest socioeconomic group in men. Um, the experience of aging is individually unique. No one person is the same. There are things you can control and there are things you can't control. 
I, I used to say when I put this slide up, you can't control your genes, but that's sort of beginning to be not true, but it's sort of true. So the experience of age, it's so, you know, I loved the word Roddy Doyle used about in company. I use social connectedness, but actually in company, when I heard him say it, is exactly the right word. Uh, they're critically important things. And, you know, t connectedness like that, is hugely important in health and well-being. And you've heard about the global population increase in ageing and the success that it is, but look what's going to happen the, as we age. That's the percentage increase in 2030, uh, in, to 2030 of the over 60. Remember, this is 2019. TikTok, it's 2020 next year. Over 65 is over 100%. Over 85 is over 150%. Look what's happening to the over 100s. Huge increase. So we've got to be able as a society both to support, uh, look after and help people as they age to manage well independently in their own surroundings. And I guess in the work I do, it's made me think rather selfishly, what do I want as I age? And I think if each of you individually ask yourself that question, you'll have completely different answers to it. But what I think I would like to do is live well and live long, be happy, be supported when I'm challenged and focus on wellness. What does that require? This whole concept of, you know, the discussion around the importance of social justice, information, education, definitely personal effort. Uh, that's easier for some than others. Societal support, government and policy, and access to healthcare, because some people won't be well. If you ask older people themselves, and there's a lot of, you know, the voice of the older person in this, and again, what, what age is old? I think you're as, you're as old as you feel, really. Um, but uh, when you ask older people about independent living, what they want is they want to stay living in their own home or community. They want it to be an appropriate accommodation, in, in inappropriate, saying that word, inappropriate accommodation, and they want to feel safe. Now that bothered me when I heard that about the feeling safe. There isn't a week go by where I don't hear about a break in and how unsettling that is. So I think on the one hand, we have to be careful. It's important that there's lots of information out there, but we have to be careful how that information uh, is, is delivered and given. Ultimately, there's no war like home. And we all know ourselves, even if you've gone away on a break or a holiday, and you've had a fantastic holiday, you just love to come back to your own environment, your own home, uh, and uh, your own routine. Uh, and supporting people to live well and independently at home or in a homely setting in the community for as long as possible has to be our goal. So I guess, what's the landscape of Ireland looking like today? Most people live at home, a very small percentage live in a nursing home. I think this underestimates the amount of formal and informal care. There's a lot of informal care that we don't hear about, um, and uh, we need to think about that. There's been a huge switch in Ireland from rural living to urban living, and there's also been a, a dispersion of the family unit. So people don't live as close, are as closely knit as they used to. Um, and a lot of people will have visited their GP in the last year. 15% uh, of people over the age of 65 have stayed in hospital overnight. Very small number of them are known to the public health nurse. The medical landscape in Ireland today, a third of people have three or more illnesses. That's chronic illness. And that's something that we have to think about and reflect on. Uh, and things like falls, frailty, and dementia are becoming, because of the success of uh, the uh, ageing demographic are becoming issues we really need to be able to address properly, both in the community and in the hospital setting. And again, if you look at it from a social deprivation point of view, I mentioned about a third of people have um, cr three chronic illnesses. In the fifth quintile, uh, up to 40% have chronic illness. So again, you know, a bit like uh, where should we target or where do we need to target the education and the investment. I think it's important not to disadvantage one group over another group. Uh, so how you get the balance of that funding correct is important. Uh, from a point of view of healthcare utilisation in the community, one in five community dwelling older adults live with frailty. And of those living with frailty, um, they will spend 15 days in hospital in a 12 month period. 40% will be living on their own alone at home. So there's a higher percentage living alone at home. So that challenges services in society to deliver services in a uh, cohesive manner to those that require it. Um, and a huge percentage of those frail older adults have two or more chronic conditions. 
Now, we're really good at a number of things in this country, and one of them is a report. Uh, so we're not short some reports about this, and we know loads about the challenges, and actually we have pathways there that are there to help drive improvements in change and delivery of care uh, to older people. There is a myriad of things like personal, societal and p policy responsibility, and this is not a party political broadcast for anyone. However, the introduction of no smoking into this country, into restaurants, uh, in public places, uh, has made an enormous difference. And it's driven down the number um, that are smoking, I heard recently, I think down to sort of 17 per cent. And that is good for your health. You know, uh, there's no question about that. And not alone is it good for your health, but it's good for the health of others from a passive smoking point of view. Um, moderation around alcohol is clearly a very important issue in this country. Um, this is a rather shocking slide, actually. Uh, what it isn't is Eamon Coughlin now, just in case anyone thought that was Eamon Coughlin. That's, that's an orangutan. Um, so look at the figures. Overweight at 40, you live three years less. Obese at 40, you live seven years less. Obese and smoke at 40, you live 14 years less. And that's not even talking about the comorbidities and the illnesses that can happen in, the, in between. So that public awareness and education right across the board is critically important. And whether that's, that has to start at primary school level, if you look at the ancient philosophers, if you go back 2,000 years, they argued about a lot. One of them had this reductive theory of age, which uh, had 10, what was it, 10 stages, each of them seven years long. Now, if you do that sum, that finishes at 70. So clearly that guy in his ph philosophical thinking got replaced by somebody else. Uh, and he said that there were many phases of aging, but three really important ones. One was zero to seven, one was maturity, and the third was old age. The zero to seven one, then they were acknowledging 2,000 years ago that you know, healthy eating, exercise, you know, even then, when you look at the readings, that's what they're getting at, were important. Uh, so we have a huge duty of responsibility and care to the younger cohort of uh, our population, as important a duty of care and responsibility as we have to the older old. Uh, Roddy Doyle used in company, so I'm going to replace that now in my slides for social connectedness. I think in company is a really lovely description of it. Uh, you could pick many societies and groups, uh, but. The GAA have a huge amount um, of a structure built uh, around the country that can be tapped into for lots of different things, and they are doing that. But you have to have equality of funding, uh, you know, and it's not just GAA clubs that are around the country. There's lots of other sporting societies and other societies that are not sporting that we need to look at funding properly. But if you think about the ability to get intergenerational involvement across society, at a local level. If you drive through rural Ireland and look at the, uh, the pitches that have been built for GAA, you really get a sense that you can tap in and harness. And they're doing that, you know, I mean, the Irish Land Institute Study of Aging are going around with the GAA and giving talks in some of the GAA clubs. So there are things we can do and piggyback on um, too. The world report on aging and health are looking at this i've mentioned this you know the time for the percentage of the population older than 60 to double that's changing as well so if you look in france it took 150 years to get from 10 to 20 percent over the age of 60. in india they're going to do that in 30 years right and that's all tied up in improvements in healthcare delivery uh, and in um, you know, services that are being provided, but it challenges society to look after and support the older old. I don't know if people are familiar with the blue zones, and I showed this a little earlier, but these aren't the blue zones, it just happens to be blue, but we're going to go from 900 million to 2 billion in the next 35, 40 years. The blue zones um, are five, five parts of the world where people age particularly well, and we'll come back to that in just a second. Japan. Uh, has a median age of 47 uh, for in 2018 and 37 for Ireland. But look at the birth rates in the two countries, lower in Japan. Uh, and that's going to be important for us to think about. Uh, life expectancy in Ireland, 81 
for 83 for women, 78 for men, uh, 85 in Japan. And Japan have the most centenarians that are around the world. And to give you an idea, or most centenarians in a country, they used to give a silver bowl to every Japanese person who got over 100, and now it's a silver plated bowl because of the numbers that are going up. In Ireland, I think we give Sean about two and a half thousand, a check for two and a half thousand to somebody when they're over 100, they get to 100. I wonder will that start coming down. So we've got to look at healthy ageing and the expenditure around it as an investment, not a cost. The investment results in benefits to the health, to health, to skills and knowledge, mobility, to supporting and driving intergenerational uh, connectedness. And there's a return with that investment for individual well-being, for um, innovation, for social and cultural contribution. So we've got to change our language, and language is critically important. If we heard, if we took nothing away from the fantastic interview between Michael and uh, Roddy Doyle there, you know, this whole concept of fighting words, language is crucially important. So for those of you that might be interested in the Blue Zones, there are five of them. Okinawa, Costa Rica, Sardinia, uh, Loma Lina in LA, and an island uh, off the coast of Greece. So they're, they're sort of islands. And when I read this story, I thought, well, actually, we're an island. You know, like if they're blue zones and they have, they're doing good things, what are they doing that we're not doing? So I know, I'm just taking one of them because you could spend a whole day talking about the blue zones. Okinawa have more people uh, over 100 years per thousand of the population than anywhere else. They have the lowest death rates from cancer, heart disease, and stroke. They have the highest life expectancy for males and females over 65. There's a lot of things they do. One of the things they do every day is to take a few moments to remember their ancestors. And they call that downshifting. And, you know, when I read that, I thought, actually, lots of people are doing different things in the world. You know, people, some people are doing mindfulness. But I do like that concept of, you know, reflecting on your ancestors uh, and your relatives. Now, I could say something about each of these on the Blue Zone Recipe for Aging Well, but I'm not going to do it. The three bits I'm going to highlight are, one there is a sense of purpose. They call it Ikigai in Japan, Plan de Vida, France. It's about purpose, having a purpose. Um, the 80% rule, Hari Hachibu, that's Japanese. I'm not very good at Japanese. That 80% rule means you stop eating when you begin to feel just before you've satisfied your hunger. So it's 80% of what you think. I'm not good at that one. Uh, and the last one, you know, uh, loved one first is actually about that remembering their ancestors, but the one I was going to talk about is the right tribe. In Okinawa, you are actually assigned five friends or people early in your life in Okinawa that actually grow together, meet together, uh, and stay in touch. Now, it's not quite as regimented as that, because I suppose, but it's not self-selected. And it is a small, close-knit community. But there's a message there. You know, belonging to a community is important. It turns out that it doesn't matter what the faith is. Uh, it's, it's belonging to some sort of a faith community, uh, or a group of people, or as Roddy Doyle said, in company. I think that's really interesting. There's an Irish recipe for aging as well, for successful aging. It isn't Guinness and uh, shamrocks. But it is actually, if you think about it, less weight, less cigarettes, less alcohol, more exercise, correct food groups, society awareness, uh, social connection, uh, know your rights and fight for them. So a movement like Social Justice Ireland, you know, has a huge responsibility and a contribution to make. A bit of stress, oddly enough, so giving the odd talk, standing up after Roddy Doyle, you know, isn't a bad idea. Um, avoid hospitals if you can. What, what I do know is that the ageing population will influence social and health systems in multiple ways. And if we ignore it, we ignore it at our peril, and we lose the advantage of the wisdom of people that are actively living with us and that have been in roles and jobs before and seen us. I still, I took the job I work in, uh, the gentleman I took it from retired when I came back 20, over 20 years ago, um, Yes, there have been huge advances in medicine in the 20 years that I've been back, but I still pick up the phone to him occasionally or meet him and have a chat with him. And there's very little that I tell him that he hasn't heard before, that he can give me a steer on. And I think one of the things that we've lost in the world we're living in uh, is the value of wisdom and advice of age. And in, in one sense, being happy to tap into it, and second, being not too proud not to think that you 
do not have all the answers. So there are priority areas for action, and uh, WHO have come out about this. And I, while you could summarise them, supports in the community are actually what it's around. But it's about improving, measuring, monitoring, and understanding. And you heard some of that this morning, and from Elizabeth's talk. It's about ensuring everyone can grow old in an age-friendly environment. It's about aligning health systems to older populations they now serve, and that's been a particular focus of mine over the last few years. Uh, and it's about developing appropriate long-term care systems. And long-term care systems are not about systems of care in nursing homes. It's about enabling people and empowering people to live at home in their own community and in their own environment. So it's back to this personal perspective, professional perspective and public perception. But we've got to improve how we age ourselves. So effectively you deliver yourself well into older age. Uh, and then that there's supports around. And as I said, you know, lots of things going on with the HSE and the Department of Health in terms of specialist models for older person service care, making a start for integrated care. Uh, you may have been familiar with the Slaunch of Care model, which is setting out to look at delivery of healthcare services. And I suppose for me, what that's actually doing is something that was blindingly obvious. It's changing a functionally separated non-geographical model into an integrated regionally aligned model. It just is impossible to understand how we actually did what we did when we did it, but now we're getting, looking to realign it. Um, and I think the thing that I've been driven by myself is if you, and you know, there some lovely publications there from social justice that I picked up and just flicked when I was uh, at, at the coffee break, um, and they're talking about a lot of these things, but if we design services for people with only one thing wrong at them at once, and people with a load of things turn up, the fault isn't with the user of the service. The fault is with the service we designed. Um, and all too often we're hearing these sort of inappropriate terms of you know, people inappropriately using services, uh, trolley blockers, bed blockers, language like that. You know, it's nothing to do with, with uh, those individuals, it's to do with the service that wasn't designed correctly. So if you want to improve delivery of care for older people, all of these things are important. But it's all around support in the community, and it's about community-based models, it's about person-centred access, um, and it's about a collaborative approach. Going back to that concept of you know, strategic thinkers that you've got sitting here in this room who aren't just, as you are doing, thinking strategically, but you're also doers. You wouldn't be sitting here at a conference like this unless you were motivated to make a change and make a contribution. And I heard a really interesting story from a 98-year-old lady, and it goes back to the sense of purpose about making a contribution. I had two medical students and a nursing student in with me in the day hospital. And I often will ask at the end of a, a, an exchange, and it'll probably tell you a lot when, uh, when I ask, the, the question I ask the person is, have you any advice to a slightly younger man about how to age well? So I'm asking that of a 98-year-old lady, and I'm considering myself to be the younger man. You have to be really careful how you ask that question, because some people look at me and say, you're not that much younger than me. And that can be upsetting. Okay? But this lady looked at me, and she said, well, she said, I'll tell you what she said. It's really important to stay outward looking for as long as you can. That was the first thing she said. And the second thing she said was, it's really important to make a contribution to the society you live in. And I looked at her and I said, my God, and I looked at the two medical students, the nursing students, and I said, my God, and I said to her, that's an extraordinary thing. I mean, how can you keep doing that? And she looked at me and she shook her head and she actually sighed and she said, my dear, and I hadn't been called my dear for a long time, she said, my dear, she said, you underestimate the contribution of a smile. And she said, a smile can change a person's day. And she, says, over. and she went down then to give this really interesting discussion. I thought to the two, three behind me, and not to me, but it was at all of us, uh, about the importance of continuing to contribute in everything you do, no matter how small that contribution might be regarded. So an extraordinary story and a big impact on me. She was frail. So you can be frail but still you know, be very robust in a lot of other ways. Frailty is a new concept that we're using to harness knowledge, understanding, and uh, you know, create a common language for people to be able to unite around to make a change to healthcare service delivery. And it's about cumulative deficits. So you're robust if you've only got a couple. The more you accumulate, the more likely you are to become frail. And if you are frail, a sudden change in your health status can happen after a minor illness. So if I get the flu, I feel a bit tired, or if I get a urine infection, I might feel a bit unwell. But for an older, frailer person, that can cause a big problem, and we have to be very alert to that. 
Hilda is looking at this uh, and is making huge strides uh, in, with regards to this. Uh, and we know frailty increases as you get older. We know that healthcare interventions and education can make a difference on that. And we know that if you have comprehensive geriatric assessment, uh, in other words, that you get access to the right social supports, the right therapy staff, the right connectedness, that we can make a difference in those people's lives. What is important is putting in place appropriate education and training. And this has been done through the National Clinical Program for Older People and the Irish Longitudinal Study of Ageing, with two nurses specifically that have driven this. Um, they've now trained over 250 uh, national facilitators out of a group of people that uh, of 500 have been through the Insights and Frailty Day in, um, in Trinity. And that group themselves have trained another 2,500 healthcare professionals to date in the last year and a half about the fundamentals of frailty. And that will make a difference. And scattered around Ireland now are loads of frailty education networks, loads of integrated care sites uh, looking to make those changes locally uh, because local driven change is a better form of change. There are now advanced nurse practitioners in older persons that are going to make a big difference. Uh, there's a very small number of them. Uh, there are, I think, 63 in the country now. There were none two years ago. Um, so we now are getting and building uh, both a knowledge and understanding and a trained workforce that can begin to impact a community level. Um, and what we're trying to do is move away from uh, this frail elderly label uh, with people presenting late in a crisis to an older person living independently at home in the community uh, where they're identified in a timely manner and they get access to community-based person-centred and coordinated services. And that's irrespective of socioeconomic group because you can have uh, asset-rich, very poor people uh, in a community uh, which are uh, every bit as disadvantaged as somebody in another socioeconomic group. And we've got to be really careful when we start uh, advocating for certain groups that we don't marginalise other groups. And, you know, I was, trying to figure my, I was trying to figure out a question for Roddy Doyle around that when he said uh, no sports funding to golf and tennis clubs, I'm not advocating for it, versus only to football. I, I think we just need to get the balance of that one right. Um, the other thing that's going to be very interesting, and I have a few minutes maybe just to, just to close up, is going to be the concept of technology um, as, uh, as we all age. And uh, again, Michael and Roddy's conversation was around technology in younger people, but in fact it's a massive issue for all of us uh, in, in the years to come. There's assistive technology, there's digital literacy, there's digital technology. It has got to be more user friendly. You know, it's really difficult. Uh, for certain uh, people to get through, uh, and I include myself in this, some of the stuff that's put online. Um, I think we have to reflect a little bit, you know, the research in assistive technology is doubling every five years. There's monitoring technology, there's functional technology, uh, there's, uh, I, I call it emotional technology, but, um, you know, there's ethical issues around this and we have to be really careful that we don't overstep, uh, you know, people's privacy. Um, you know, uh, people are very happy on their phone having, uh, knowing where their kids are on WhatsApp or Snapchat and being able to follow where they're going around. Uh, you know, would you be happy if uh, somebody else was, you know, able to find you easily on your phone like that? Is that an intrusion, intrusion of privacy or when does it infringe that? But these, undoubtedly these technologies make independent living and reduce that little bit easier and reduce risk. It'll never get rid of risk. Um, you know, there is clear functional technology being evol evolving, which will support people uh, when they're up and walking. Um, there's a Japanese robot now that lifts patients in their beds into wheelchairs and helps them stand up. Uh, I'm really uncomfortable with this for some reason. I, I think we're losing the importance of the personal touch on this. And I don't know any uh, older person in Ireland who looks like that. So, you know, uh, you know we, we have to be very careful what we do with the assisted technology. I don't know if you heard uh, Stevie, who's a robot that's been made, and you may be very familiar with Elizabeth and Trinity, uh, was on the front of Time magazine there a couple of weeks ago. Um, and Stevie, in, interesting, Trinity are doing that in conjunction with uh, 
a group in the States, which really interests me. Um, but Stevie is over in the States in a nursing home, and he conducts the karaoke rehearsals and music in, in that uh, nursing home. So is that a good thing? Uh, is it replacing people? Is it diminishing? The, like, I don't know, but we need to think about these things. Um, and, and I'm, you know, distinctly uncomfortable with some of these, you know, I, like, but, but again, that's my bias. You know, like doll therapy, for example, is very well described as a, as a support and an aid in some people with dementia and is far preferable than giving sedative medication. But I, inherently, I think sometimes we're, we're looking to replace uh, the human touch with technology. And if we can get the balance right of that, it can be fantastic. So we all grow old, but we're forever young. And I don't know if anybody actually was able to identify any of these. But uh, that's a really important Kerry team to me, because that's a Kerry team that played out there in 1955 in a really important Dublin Kerry final. But then I suppose all Dublin Kerry finals are important, are they? And Kerry won that year, and my father was on the team. And uh, I know the impact that had on his small rural village in Carseveen. Uh, and Michael, unfortunately, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I, he, he was possibly the first man in a long time to have won an All Ireland medal in That's South Kerry. Too, yeah. yeah, and then subsequent to that, you had people like Jack O'Shea, Morris Fitz, uh, you know, a whole lot of other people. But it had a huge impact on his life, it had a huge impact on our lives, and the generational fun that, and connectedness we've got out of that over the years has meant a huge amount to our family. But how do you tap into that? around the country in general, because I see it myself when I'm down in Grange this year, Tip won the All-Ireland Hurling Final, and I saw the Lee McCarthy being brought back to the primary school there where one of the guys was on the team. You know, massive impacts. So we need to learn how to tap into these things. So it's back to what the older person wants themselves. Not what I want, not what you want, but what we've got to work towards. It's about people wanting to stay living in their own community or their own home for as long as possible, but in appropriate accommodation. And for me, appropriate accommodation means appropriate support as well. It doesn't mean uh, ground floor living uh, with whatever. It means with ability to support. And they want, people want to feel safe, but then we all want to feel safe. That's a tougher one, I think. I'm going to finish. Seamus Heaney wasn't in my soundings book. Um, he, uh, had, I, I had the privilege of meeting him about eight or ten years ago, and uh, he taught, I was in a room on my own with him for about 15 minutes because we were sort of put somewhere to sit out of the uh, thing, and he had a conversation with me about poetry, and I got completely re-engaged in it, and I got completely re-energised in reading it, and I think this is a very used quote of his, uh, but I absolutely believe, from the point of view of an ageing perspective and what this country is starting out to do, when you hear about the type of research being done around the country, when you hear what Elizabeth's talk was, when you hear the other talks this morning, and you hear the Irish London Tudor study of ageing, we're gathering the evidence, we have the facts, we need to plan. And it needs to be done in a just way, in a just society. So I absolutely believe a further shore is reachable from here. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Dermot. And if I may say, it was quite invigorating coming in the wake of Roddy Dial. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, have we any questions? Just down here. Just get the mic to you now, one second. Um, Neville Keery is my name. Just a few quick points. You see how important a GP is. I lived abroad for a time, and I was quite shocked when I came back to Ireland and found that my, neither my blood pressure nor my weight was recorded every time I went to the GP. And I can't understand why Irish GPs are not collecting objective data. The other thing, uh, I agree with all you say about exercise and so on, and it's imp very important to combat frailty and the biggest problem about frailty is how important balance is. And balance can be easily taught and encouraged and lifting weights and things like that, that there should be a big emphasis on uh, the exercise that helps uh, elderly people to uh, do, do well. 
they're just two points. So, Neville, thanks for your comments, and I completely agree with you. On the exercise front, on the balance front, Japan have, um, I'm harping on about Japan a lot, but they were, in, they were on my radar for the last few months I was reading about them. Um, they now give their young primary school going children uh, these small unicycles, and they do it to help them improve their balance and core strength, because what happens when you get up, now it's not the unicycle that I know of, of the clown, the, the big tall one, it's the little one. Um, they give it to encourage core strength, balance and resilience and build resilience because you fall down, you get back up. When I saw and heard about it, I thought, can you imagine that passing health and safety regulations in Irish schools? It would not happen. So the other thing you said about blood pressure and weight is correct. Uh, it just highlights the importance of education and training and constantly saying the same message because you probably have picked out the two single most important things, uh, uh, bar smoking, sorry, that we can actually do to make a huge difference to population health at large and then to individual health. So thank you. Anybody else? One thing that strikes me there, there uh, in terms of, as, as you call it, in company, and that idea of socialisation, uh, Roddy Doyle's term, as you said, uh, is that going to be more challenging in terms of the way we live than progressively the way we've lived, both in terms of urbanisation and, and, and living quarters and what have you? Is that going to be more difficult going into the future, or would you be confident that we, we, we've uh, a handle on it? I, I think we're becoming more aware of it than we have been, which I think is a really important start to getting a handle on it. It's funny, now I have a skewed view of this because I, I think, and it's a pity Sean Moynihan isn't here, but I think, uh, I think oddly it's more possible to be alone in the city than it is to be alone in the country at times because they, people seem, and I, and I just see this from myself and Dan and Tip and Kerry, uh, people seem to find a reason to meet uh, in a better way than they do. I think someone, I don't know who said, it actually was Roger Doyle, or you said it, you know, the 20 minutes go down to the shop here may actually be way more important than actually whether you have milk in or not. It's actually the exercise, the meeting, the chatting, uh, and fine if you forget to bring the milk back, you can go back down again, you know. <laughs> but uh, So I think we're more aware of it, which is a good thing. Yeah, it's a good start. Okay, and we just, we've one, we'll take one more question here, please. Thanks a million. Um, I absolutely loved your talk. It was great. It was so inspiring. I must uh, look at how I give talks to make them a bit more interesting. Um, so just one minor thing when you were talking about sport, and Roddy Doyle talked about it as well. Like My memories of doing sports like GEA and stuff are being bored out of my mind and very cold on a wintry Irish pitch. So you did reference a bit about other forms of sport. So I think, yeah, it'd be great to say more about how do we fund things like dance and hiking and outdoors. There's so much brilliant sport to do that um, we could focus on a lot more. And I, I don't think a lot of them are very much in the kind of government focus, really. So just a couldn't suggestion. Agree, couldn't agree with you more. You've, you've, opened, you've opened up a lovely avenue for me there. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I think that's it. I'm going to just... Oh, sorry. We have one more. Have we... Somebody... Actually, I wanted to ask a question myself. Go on, excuse if that's me. Okay. Sorry. Go on. It was just uh, to agree, I suppose, with your point about robotics and how, you know, the personal touch is important, but just wondering about thoughts about how we're going to pay... Uh, carers as well, because one of the problems at the moment is that both older people and carers, you know, get trapped in into very disadvantaged situations. Mm -hmm. And you know, how are we going to have proper pay and not precarious working situations for professional carers as our population ages? Yeah, and you want to make, you want me to answer that in a second? Well, <laughs> just to have you on the top okay, of the head. Thoughts. No, no, no. So, so I think y you make a really good point and I so I don't have an I I'd, I'd rabbit on for ages with an answer and I wouldn't be clear about it I think the points you make clearly there is a place for technology uh, and it will make it possible to be more connected with people and keep and support a large number of people at home in the community with a smaller number of people to provide that work but you absolutely have to have the hands-on touch you cannot be, like, the, and you know yourself, if you Skype some, it's lovely Skyping somebody or FaceTime somebody, it's not the same. And that's even a minor example of it. So 
we have a load of things we have to get our head around, and you've beautifully highlighted one of them. So no answer. Sorry. On that note, I would just like to thank Dr. Dermot O'Shea for a really interesting talk, the last paper we have this evening. Um, and now to bring proceedings to a close, we're just going to have Dr. Healy back up again to um, close the conference. Thanks, Mick. And um, I don't know uh, what to say at one level because it's been a really, really good day. And um, I had a lot to say in the introduction uh, this morning, and I was given out about a few things. And um, I'd still be given out about them, uh, only more so now, uh, having uh, gone through the day. I think the key point I was making today in the morning, I suppose, was that. Our society and, and, and policy makers and so on, they need accurate analysis. They need a commitment to seek a better future for everybody, not just some people, for all. Uh, they need a commitment to travel the pathways, discover the ways to get from here towards a better future for all. And they need good communication if those things are to happen. And that, in a way, that's what jo Social Justice Ireland is about that we try very hard to provide good analysis, accurate analysis of the current situation at all times, specific issues, larger, broader contexts, and so on. We also try to project into the future and see what could the future be like, a future where there was a place for everybody, where everybody was respected and their basic rights um, were respected and so on. Where a, a, a future in which um, the, the environment was respected and protected as well. Uh, we also worked very hard at trying to work out pathways to get from here to there. Uh, and we call that sort of the analysis, first the, the vision of the future, second, and pathways from, eight, from one to the other. We call this our ABC. And we, we, it, it remains our ABC. And our conferences and the rest of the work that we do is built on that. We do research studies. We, do, we publish briefings, we publish uh, an annual socioeconomic uh, review, we publish research on proposals, we hold conferences, we do a lot of different events. Um, and all the time we're trying to provide the analysis of the present ideas about the future and how to travel from one to the other. And in a way that's what today's conference was about. The title of the, the conference is very important, it's the challenges of success. We were very adamant that this was not going to be another one of those, you know, pension bombshells and all the rest of it, um, that, uh, you know, and uh, the tragedy of frailty and all this kind of stuff uh, that, that you were, and some of the, some of the, the, um, the headlines that, um, that uh, Sean Moynihan had in his presentation. But it was like addressing population growth in Ireland is a challenge of our success. And uh, the reality, of course, is that as the, as, uh, James Hegarty showed in that first paper, we're heading into a very uh, steep growth uh, trajectory in terms of the population over the next 20, 30 years. And overall population growth, but also uh, I think uh, over 65 is going from 690,000 to 1.6 million between now and 2051. 2051 is only 32 years or 31 years away. So I think that, that that's a very important thing. We look. The, uh, we had uh, two very good presentations from Sean Wine and, and Colette Bennett uh, looking at the whole housing situation and looking at the need to, to provide integrated services and the implications for policy and all of that. Elizabeth Nixon provided an excellent um, uh, uh, presentation and uh, I, all, I, I was kind of smiling because uh, the title of, the se of that section we had, the kids are okay, aren't they? with a question mark, and for the most part, I think the question mark is probably taken away. There, there's things to be dealt with, but there are some very positive results coming out from that study, which is a really good thing. It might involve or require, as, as Roddy suggested, that we abolish the leave insert and put more money in sport, but um, I'd be all for that. But anyway, I'd have been all, far more for it when I was doing my leave insert, but that's another story. Um, and so we, we and, and Diarmid uh, provided again 
like uh, 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 looking at aging from the point of view of success and like what the implications are and again to, to echo the comment that somebody else made that like to say, I think it was Anne-Marie about your presentation was and it was terrific it's, and I've, I, I've heard you do this before in various ways and it's always inspiring so it's, it's really really something special um, so it's been a terrific day and I want to thank you, especially those of you who now that have stayed all this time. This is this is the end of the day, the line, and you've stayed to the end. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to the speakers and to Roddy Doyle as well. I've mentioned them all. Um, I want to say a really special thanks to Mick Clifford, who chaired again uh, in, a, in a tremendously competent and capable way and uh, very user-friendly, if I might use that. Uh, that uh, the participants, I think, feel very at home with you and they, 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 they really enjoy the day when you're, when you're there. Um, and uh, I'd also want to say a special word of thanks to, to um, Angela and to um, Anne Leahy and Mag Sassett um, for the work that you did in terms of putting the, doing the bits and pieces that had to be done. And then uh, our own staff for uh, Michelle and, the, and the, all the media work and um, Eamon and all the social media, a lot of you may not be conscious of it, but there's been a stream of social media pouring out all day and it's all emanating from the corner down there, <laughs> in, in most of it anyway, in Eamon's computer and it's, it's done very well, um, uh, thanks to him on that uh, and thanks to Bridget for uh, keeping all the stuff running smoothly or whatever, but a special thanks to Colette who has led out on this conference and it's the first time that uh, she's led out on this particular conference and uh, did a fantastic job and did a terrific paper as well. So uh, I think we say thank you especially to Colette. And so I think that's, that's about it, saying a sincere thank you to you. And uh, for those who are members of Social Justice Ireland, our AGM follows in about 15 minutes, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you.